Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, this should be a fun diversion from other things we're doing. We'll develop methods that are useful in photogrammetry and uh, robotics, in particular dealing with um, rotation, which uh, has some strange properties. So, w for example, in uh, the case of translation, things are commutative. If I go 5 meters in x and 10 meters in y, I end up in the same place as if I go uh, 10 meters in y and 5 meters in x. I, uh, this is not the case with rotation. And to illustrate, I have suppose that this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. So I'm going to take... Um, this eraser and rotate it uh, 90 degrees about the x-axis, like that, and then 90 degrees about the y-axis, and I end up there. And I take the equivalent eraser and I rotate it uh, 90 degrees about the y-axis, and then 90 degrees about the x-axis, and I'm there. So fortunately that worked. So they're not the same. And so it's not commutative. So it's um, a little bit more difficult to deal with, particularly when it comes to uh, least squares problems and um, fitting of uh, data to observations. So uh, here's an outline of what we're going to be uh, talking about. Uh, properties of rotation, different representation for rotations, and in particular the one we're going to pick, which is uh, Hamilton. Hamilton's quaternions, and um, they are more general, but if we restrict attention to unit quaternions, they map directly onto rotations in three space. They allow us to talk about a space of rotations. So for translation, obviously, you know, three space is our space of translations. And if we do some optimization, that's the space we're searching in, that's the space we tessellate, that's the space where um, we get our answers. Whereas uh, it's not so obvious with rotation. You know, what, say you want to take an average of force on a seat belt over all possible orientations of a car. Um, that's something that, you know, if it was translation, it'd be trivial. You just integrate over some volume of space, divide by its volume, and you're done. So that, that's something we'll be able to do. Applications are, for us, mostly in photogrammetry, although they're um, very important in uh, robotics and graphics and um, control of spacecraft. So we'll talk about some of that. And in particular, uh, using this, we're going to develop a closed-form solution to the problem that we uh, started talking about last time, which is you know, either measurements in two different coordinate systems of the same object or measurements in one coordinate system of two objects or one object that moved. So, and just for fun, at the end, we'll briefly talk about um, division algebras uh, and space-time. And so here, some of the things I mentioned where we need to have a good representation for rotation. Uh, obviously, in machine vision, for recognition and for determining the orientation of an object in space for the robot arm to, and so on. So, um, you know, down to protein folding, uh, cryo -micros electron microscopy. Um, we all need a good representation for rotation there. And uh, in particular, with uh, robotic situations, we're dealing with uh, motions in space. Euclidean motions, which uh, can be decomposed into translations and rotations. And the Euclidean motions have the property that they preserve distances between points, they preserve angles between lines, and they preserve handedness, which sometimes we forget. But if we don't put that in, then we're going to get uh, reflections. As you know, most of the biologically important uh, chemicals exist in, in one particular form the mirror image form doesn't work. And so it's you know, kind of important to preserve handedness. Um, 
put together, those mean that we preserve dot products and we preserve uh, triple products. And we're leaving out, uh, by doing this, transformations of free space that you know, would otherwise be perfectly reasonable, such as reflections and uh, skewing and scaling. We'll talk a little bit about uh, scaling, but mostly for the moment we leave it out. So uh, rotations. First, uh, Euler's theorem. Uh, any rotation of a rigid object has the property that there is a line that is not changed. That's the axis. Then um, there's the parallel axis theorem, which says that any rotation about any axis is equivalent to a rotation about an axis through the origin plus a translation. So for us, it's going to be very convenient to separate translation and rotation this way, that when we talk about rotation that we're trying to recover, we're just going to talk about rotation about an axis through the origin because we deal with the translation separately. And because of the parallel axis theorem, uh, we can do that. Then if we figure out how a sphere rotates, we basically figured out how everything rotates because we can, uh, and that sort of simplifies things, we can just think of a uh, sphere rotating in space and all the possible ways that can happen, and that then corresponds to um, rotation of space. Um, when we talk about attitude, we basically mean orientation. We mean orientation relative to some standard. So, for example, we might have uh, models, as we had in, when we're talking about the patents, except now in 3D, and they'll be in some preferred coordinate system. And when we talk about locating that object, we're talking about finding its position in space and finding its rotation relative to that reference rotation. So, by the way, um, this is going to be on Stellar, uh, this whole presentation. Then there's a um, four-page blurb that summarizes everything you want to know about quaternions, or, or maybe not. Um, maybe everything you need for this course. Um, degrees of freedom. So we talked about this last time, that uh, there happen to be three degrees of freedom to rotation, and that can be slightly confusing. What's interesting is that rotational velocity is much easier. Uh, angular velocity, all we need is a vector that gives us the axis and a rate, uh, so many radians per second, and if we take the axis and multiply it by the rate, we have a three vector. And those three vectors add, just like translations. So if you're spinning around the x-axis at you know, one radian per second, you're spinning about the y-axis at one radian per second, then you're spinning about the one, one, zero axis. You know, so it's very easy to just add these up. And um, of course, that can change. So now you've moved a little bit, and the next time instance, the axes will be different and so on. But instantaneously, uh, rotational velocity is very easy. And this, uh, for those of you who know about these things, uh, corresponds to you know, the, the Lie algebra versus the Lie group. The uh, rotational velocities are the Lie algebra. It has all the nice properties of an algebra. Uh, the uh, rotations, which are sort of the integral of that, don't. They don't have quite those nice properties. Uh, Poisson's formula tells you what the velocity is of some point uh, when there's a known rotational velocity. Uh, right, rotational velocity. So omega is that vector, the um, axis of which is the axis of the direction of which is the axis of rotation, and the magnitude of it is the rate of rotation. And then if we have some point r. We just to take that cross product to figure out what the velocity is. And obviously, uh, it's going to be perpendicular to r, and it's going to be perpendicular to omega. And you can you know, get its direction by using the right-hand rule. So rotational velocity is simpler. They add, uh, and we just saw finite, finite rotations don't commute. And we talked last time about how they're um, uh, n times n minus 1 over 2 degrees of freedom. And for n equals 3, that happens to give you 3. So often we talk about rotation about axes, like I just did, rotation about the x-axis, rotation about the y-axis. And if you follow that uh, view, then you might think that in n dimensions, rotation is n-dimensional. Uh, and therefore, it is better to think about rotation as rotation preserving certain planes. 
So for example, we can preserve the xy plane. Uh, we can rotate in such a way that the xy plane is not changed. The things in the xy plane are moved into the xy plane somewhere else. Uh, yz plane and zx plane, also three. But that one works because in, in 2D, we only have the xy plane, one degree of freedom. And in 4D, we have uh, six combinations. And that's the number of degrees of freedom of rotation in 4D. OK. Um, so before we uh, go further, uh, here's an interesting thing that we will exploit. And also, it's a uh, kind of preview of a method we'll use, which is uh, you know, cross products. Cross products, as I mentioned, are kind of confusing because you take the product of two vectors and you get another vector, uh, which isn't quite right. But it happens to have three degrees of freedom, so we represent it as a vector. And um, again, that's a coincidence. W what is it? Well, it's perpendicular to the two vectors you started with. And so in um, higher dimensional space, if you take, um, if you say, you know, what are the things that are perpendicular to two vectors? Well, they're not going to be a vector. There's going to be a whole subspace. So the generalization of a cross product would be something more complicated. Like uh, one way to generalize it in an n-dimensional space is it's that vector that's perpendicular to n minus one other vectors. Well, here n minus one happens to be two, so that's where we get our cross product. And it's uh, actually very convenient for certain operations particularly matrix vector operations, to represent the cross product in this way, where we um, uh, take the skew symmetric matrix, and we can represent A cross B by multiplying that uh, skew symmetric matrix by B. And it has the right degrees of freedom, right? Because A has three degrees of freedom. A skew symmetric matrix has zero on the diagonal, and uh, the off-diagonal symmetric, so you, you again have three degrees of freedom. So th that seems like a reasonable isomorphism. And um, uh, then once you've done that, you've gotten rid of this weird thing, the cross product, and you have something that you can manipulate in combination with other vectors and matrices. Now, of course, why did we uh, pick A to expand as the matrix? We could equally well have picked B and have written it this way, equally valid. Uh, and you'll notice this matrix is uh, you know, uh, transpose or negated version of, of that matrix. So the matrix for B, uh, so it's order dependent. And we know that because uh, cross products uh, don't, don't commute. So. OK, there are loads of representations for rotation, which tells you that there's a problem. You know, With translation, we just have x, y, z, be done with it. Um, so one, uh, one uh, notation that's very useful is um, axis and angle. So we have an axis which can be given as a unit vector, and we have a, a number of degrees that we rotate, or radians that we rotate through. So that's three degrees of freedom because the unit vector only has two, and plus the angle gives us three. Um, now, uh, sometimes uh, we can derive other notations from that. One of them is the Gibbs vector which tries to combine those two you know, uh, into a single thing. So this, this is sort of inconvenient in a way because you've got a three vector, which happens to be a unit vector, and then you have this thing. So the Gibbs vector is a vector, and, and it turns out that you don't want to just multiply by theta. That doesn't give you uh, nice algebraic properties. Uh, it's much better, uh, plus you know, theta wraps around two pi, so that doesn't really make much sense anyway. Uh, and Gibbs found out that uh, you can get some useful properties by taking tan theta over 2. So now you have a vector that's no longer a unit vector, so it has three components. So it has the right number of degrees of freedom. Only bad thing is it blows up at theta equals pi, right? Because tan of pi over 2 is infinite. Uh, and theta over pi, so is that a problem? Well, you know, rotating through 180 degrees, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So it's not like 
we want to exclude that because it's not a, a reasonable thing to do. So that is a problem, and it's very similar to you know y equals mx plus c when when the line happens to be perpendicular up uh, parallel to the y-axis. Uh, then uh, we have Euler angles, and there's a classic uh, uh, text in mechanical engineering by by Gold, uh, which explains about Euler angles. Basically, you know you rotate about x, you rotate about y, you rotate about z. Uh, if you're in an airplane, uh, you have roll which is uh, rotation about the axis, uh, length, long axis of the plane. Then you have pitch, which is um, uh, going up or down. And then you have yaw, which is going left and right. So it's uh, very convenient to think about that. But as you know, the result will depend on the order. So yeah, if you have very small angles of roll, pitch, and yaw, which is a comfortable airplane flight, it probably doesn't matter a lot because you get pretty much the same uh, result if you uh, compose them in different orders. But if you have uh, large angles, like 90 degrees, you know, it, it's definitely not going to work. So that means if you define Euler angles, you've got to do several things. One of them is you have to define the order of uh, operations. You know, does the x-axis come first and so on. Plus, uh, are the rotations about the new axes after you rotate or about the original axes. Anyway, as a result of this, as Gould points out, there are 24 different definitions for Euler angle, and there hasn't been an international meeting to say, you know, thou shalt use this one. So it's, it's pretty confusing. Then we have, of course, orthonormal matrices, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, and they have these uh, two constraints on them. Uh, and then this one is a kind of exotic one, um, this uh, represents a rotation matrix in an exponential form. So what does this mean? Well, uh, here, this uh, capital omega is that uh, three by three skew symmetric matrix that you get for cross product. Uh, and so what does it mean to have exponential with a matrix in the uh, uh, exponent? Well, you just use the formula for uh, e to the x except now x is the matrix instead of uh, scalar. So you're going to end up with, you know, 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared and so on, where x now is a matrix. So you can make this work, but we won't uh, pursue this. It's, um, the, and there are others. So here's another one, uh, stereography. So there are lots of projections of the sphere, and, you know, there's a whole cottage industry dating back hundreds of years because people found it necessary to take the spherical or almost spherical Earth and map it onto a plane so they could sell maps. And so there are lots of these. One of them uh, is conformal. That is, it preserves angles. And uh, it's called stereography. And as we said, a rotation of a sphere induces rotation of the space. So uh, we can take a sphere, map it onto the plane, then mush things around in the plane and map them back onto the sphere. And if we mush things around just the right way in the plane, uh, then we actually have induced the rotation on the sphere. Uh, we'll, we'll look at a picture of that. Again, we're not going to use that, but it's kind of uh, amusing. The thing you do in the plane is to treat the plane as a complex plane and do some uh, homogeneous transformation on that. And then, of course, uh, physicists you know, uh, have to invent their own stuff. So there's a, a type of two-by-two two complex matrix that can be used to represent rotation uh, that uh, Pauli came up with, uh, the, the same man who's famous for saying, you know, that paper isn't even wrong, so, as a criticism of one of his uh, colleagues. Uh, so two-by-two uh, two complex numbers, that sounds like eight degrees of freedom. Uh, well, they're not just any, they have to be Hermitian and they have to be unitary. So it turns out that after you do that, there are only three degrees of freedom left. Uh, then we get to Euler parameters, sometimes also called um, Gonzalez parameters, Rodriguez parameters, excuse me. Um, and then we get to unit quaternions. Now, of course, there's a relation between all of them, and in fact, uh, it's important to be able to convert between them. And uh, we'll do some of that. And it's a little bit like uh, many other problems where 
you're trying to solve something, and it turns out if you have the right representation, it, the answer is easy. And so often the problem then ends up being the conversion. And so then you find that, well, the conversion is complicated. Just like you know, in the trivial case, we could have polar coordinates versus Cartesian coordinates, and maybe the answer in, the, in polar coordinates is trivial, but it's not in the Cartesian coordinates, and then you're left with a conversion. Well, in that case, the conversion is not too hard, but here, here sometimes it is. Okay, so uh, let's start with that. This is Rodriguez. Rodriguez was a uh, <coughs> banker uh, in Paris, and apparently he found banking a fairly boring profession because he'd spend his nights doing math. And so this is one of his results. Basically, uh, the operations we're going to want to do are two. One operation is take a vector and rotate it or find out what that vector is in a rotated coordinate system, equivalent problem. The other one is composing rotations. We've rotated a little bit in this, around this axis. Now we're going to rotate about another axis. What is the overall result? And that turns out to be you know, non-trivial. So this here uh, is addressing that first problem. So we have a vector r, and we have an axis of rotation that's uh, here you know, vertical. And we're going to rotate through an angle theta about that axis, and that will take us to a new position, uh, r pri prime. And the question is, you know, how do you compute r prime? Well, if we first convert it to a 2D problem, you know, in this plane indicated by this ellipse, then it's very easy because we just take this vector and that vac vector and combine them in a weighted fashion. So uh, this uh, dotted vector is um, this vector times cosine theta plus this vector times sine theta. So uh, you can see how when theta is zero, the dotted vector will be equal to this one, and when theta is equal to one, uh, pi over two, it'll be equal to this vector, and all the way along it retains its, its length and so on. So in 2D rotation, as we know, it's very simple. And, and like mathematicians want to often do, we reduce a complicated problem to one, a simpler one we already know how to solve. But that's in this plane. And so we first have to figure out what, what these two vectors are that we are combining using cosine and sine. And so first of all, this one here. So how do we get that one? Well, we take r and we subtract out uh, this vector. Right? And the difference is going to be this vector here. Well, um, that means that we need to know what this vector is. Well, that's just projecting r onto omega. And since omega is the unit vector, it's very easy. There's the formula. And so therefore, this vector is r minus that thing. And then finally, we need to know what this vector is. And uh, basically, it, that vector has to be perpendicular to omega. And it has to be perpendicular to this, because in this plane, it's pi over 2 away from that vector. Right? So by taking the cross product of, uh, of um, uh, let's see, this, this thing here with this thing here, we end up with, after simplification, just omega cross r. And it makes sense, because it's going to be perpendicular to r, and it's going to be perpendicular to omega. Anyway, you put all of those things together, you get this formula. So r prime, the, the vector after rotation, is cosine theta r, the vector before rotation, uh, plus uh, these terms. And you, know, you can see that rotation's not quite that trivial. So anyway, so, uh, we'll, so uh, axis and angle is a useful notation. And it's often a good way to visualize things. You know, it's easy to say, OK, we're rotating about the x-axis through 90 degrees. It's easy to understand what it is. What's the disadvantage? The disadvantage is if, if composition. If you have two uh, rotations given as axis and angle, how do you combine them into a single? We know by Euler's theorem there's a single rotation that uh, represents the combination, uh, but how do you combine them? Well, it turns out uh, what I would do is convert both of these to some other form, like, like uh, orthonormal matrices. Multiply the orthonormal matrices, go back to this form. So, so that's a disadvantage. There is no, it's, you can rotate vectors. That's the one operation we want. It's hard to do uh, composition of rotation. So, uh, OK, well, we'll skip this. This is the exponential Lie algebra view of things. And so 
uh, to, uh, to get that. I just wanted to point um, at this one, which I, we mentioned. So here the idea is that <clears throat> here's our sphere that we're going to rotate, and we project it onto a plane, which happens to be tangent at the North Pole. And this projection, if your center of projection is the South Pole, so you go from the South Pole to a point on the surface and that, uh, then extend that line until it hits that plane. And you'll see a couple of things. One of them is you can map the whole sphere onto a plane. Well, except the South Pole, right? Uh, the other one you can see is uh, areas are going to be distorted, right? Because if we're dealing with, uh, say, Alaska up here, it's going to be mapped onto the plane without much magnification. But if we're looking at Australia, you know, it's going to come out way over here. It's going to be huge. So uh, this particular map projection is actually uh, used for the polar regions because most of the other map projections don't work very well there. Um, but it does have that feature. And why is it liked so much? Well, because it doesn't distort shapes. So and it preserves angles. Most, uh, you know, all other projections have the property that um, they will distort shapes, they will distort areas. You, you have your choice. You know, you can pick uh, projections that preserve area, you can pick projections that preserve shape, uh, angles, um, but you can't do both. Okay, so uh, we start off, we take our sphere, we project it onto this, pla map, this plane, which is the complex plane. Then in that complex plane, we do this operation. So z is a complex variable coordinate in this plane. And z prime is its new position. So, um, and a, b, c, d are uh, complex numbers. So everything in that plane is going to get moved around, and now we project it back on the sphere. And the amazing thing is that the pattern on the sphere is just a rotated version of what it was before. And therefore, we can think of rotation in free space instead in terms of some operation in the complex plane, which is pretty amazing. So that's yet another representation. OK, so what are the desirable properties? We already mentioned some of them. We, we need to be able to rotate vectors or equivalently rotate coordinate systems. We, uh, but also, we need to be able to compose rotations. Um, we would like to have an intuitive representation, you know, like axis and angle sort of intuitive. It's easy to understand what that is. Whereas if you look at a rotational matrix, you look at the numbers, you know, what do they mean? I don't know. You, you, you multiply a vector and see what happens, but the numbers don't directly mean anything. And if you know a little bit more about it, you say, well, if I look at the trace with the sum of diagonal elements, it's, I don't know, 2 times 1 minus the cosine of the angle of rotation, but it's not very intuitive. Uh, then, is it redundant? Well, uh, orthonormal matrices are a prime example of something that's definitely not redundant uh, because uh, we have nine numbers to represent three things. Yeah. Right, that's a very good point. So, so much for my story about it not being intuitive. Uh, well, if you think about rotating uh, the x-axis, i.e. 1, 0, 0, multiply the matrix by that, you get the first column. So, uh, as he's pointing out, the first column is a significant vector. It's what happens to the x-axis. Second column is what happens to the y-axis. Third column is what happens to the z-axis. So. Uh, you can understand the rotation matrix that way. And similarly, you can talk about the, the rows going in the other direction. Um, but, you know, you wouldn't know the axis of rotation or the angle of rotation. So. But yes, that, that's a good point. Okay, uh, redundant. So let's see. Um, uh, axis and angle. Well, axis and angle is kind of redundant because if we have a vector, it has three components plus an angle is four. Uh, Gibbs vector is not redundant because we've, you know, multiplied the vector by the tangent of theta over two. Um, but we don't want singularities. Gibbs vector has a singularity. So we'd also like it to be computationally efficient. And we'll uh, get into that a little bit. 
And we want to be able to do lots of things. For example, interpolate orientation. So in graphics, uh, we might often have uh, some person performing some dance or action in the world. And we would like the artist to only have to specify certain distinct points rather than you know, every frame. And so we'll need to interpolate. Well, if that person is rotating, how do we interpolate? How do you do a partial uh, rotation? And so you, know, you might say, well, half a rotation, that's the square root of the rotation matrix. Right, because if you multiply that by itself, you get the rotation matrix. But what, how do you get the square root of a matrix? So, so uh, that's something. Another thing we might want to do is get averages of ranges of rotation. Um, for us, a big deal is going to be optimization. We're going to try and fit coordinate system. We're going to try and fit measurements to models. And in that case, we need to be able to do things like take a derivative and set the result equal to zero. Well, the derivative with respect to a rotation matrix that you know, doesn't make a lot of sense. So what, what is it? Well, something with nine components, but you know, how do you enforce the constraints? Then, in some cases where we can't uh, get a closed form solution, uh, we might want to sample that space and um, you know, try, try uh, some subset. But we'd like to sample the space in an efficient way, which means we want to sample it uniformly. So if it was a translation space, we'd just you know, chop up space into uh, voxels, uh, equally spaced, uh, and we'd be done. Or if we uh, go into for a random sampling, we could just uh, generate a random x between the range and the random y between the certain, in a certain range and the z in a certain range. But how do you do that for rotations? Now, if you did it in Euler angles, you could say, OK, well, I'll take the first angle uh, between minus 90 and plus 90, and then the second angle, and so on. And you get into a non-uniform sampling of the space. For example, it, you know, a much easier example is uh, on, on the sphere. We can use uh, latitude and longitude as coordinates. But if you use that to control your sampling, you're going to sample much more closely near the two poles, right? So uh, that's, um, you know, one more, add one more dimension and you get the problem for uh, rotations. So the idea of having a space of no rotations is very uh, attractive because then we can tessellate that space, we can sample it uniformly or randomly, we can compute averages or whatever. Uh, so here are some of the problems we already talked about. Uh, you know, the orthonormal matrices, they're redundant, and the constraints are complicated. Uh, Euler angles uh, don't make it easy to uh, compose rotations, just as with angle and axis notation. Best thing you can do is convert it to uh, orthonormal matrix and multiply. And then there's gimbal lock. So uh, I know you're all too young for this, but there was a time when man went to the moon, which was a very exciting time. And when you listened on television uh, and you ignored the stupid commentators that were talking over the uh, communication from the cabin, you'd hear them talk about ca uh, approaching gimbal lock. So what was that? Well, they, uh, Draper Lab built their navigation system, and it had gyroscopes in it. And gyroscopes basically have three, uh, that type of gyroscope has three axes, and it has a uh, Part that is spinning at high speed and wants to continue spinning around that axis. And then the, uh, the cage basically uh, allows the uh, spacecraft to rotate about that fixed direction. But um, as with Euler angles, you can get to a situation where two of the axes line up. And then you've lost the degree of freedom. And if you move through that point, you've basically lost your orientation in space. So they were carefully instructed not to uh, uh, go through that point because their uh, automated uh, systems wouldn't, wouldn't work correctly. And so um, that's exactly the problem with Euler angles, that when you rotate one of them through 90 degrees, it lines up with the next one, and you've lost a degree of freedom. And so, how, by the way, how do you solve it? Well, uh, the easiest way is to have four axes. And in that case, unfortunately, you can no longer treat it as a passive system. You have to have an active system that drives the axis so that you never have two of them uh, line up. Anyway, Euler angles. Uh, Gibbs vector had that singularity. 
Uh, axis and angle has the problem of the composing rotations, and then, of course, we don't have a clear idea of what is the space of rotations. So we get to Hamilton, uh, who lived in Dublin, Ireland, and he was fascinated by um, algebraic couples. So the view is that we think of complex numbers as pairs of reals, and can we somehow uh, generalize that? Uh, and you want to have a nice algebra. You want to be able to add, subtract, multiply, and very important, you want to be able to divide. You, I mean, you can do all sorts of wonderful things, but if you, co if you can do that, then you can solve equations, you know, by subtracting, cross-multiplying, doing all those things we're used to. And so uh, there was a lot of interest in physics, particularly in dealing with vectors in space. Well, they weren't called vectors, but dealing with points in space. And so the natural thing was, you know, let's go from real numbers to complex numbers to triples. And w then what can we do with the triples? Well, uh, you can multiply them. And of course, the dot product's not much use for this purpose because it's a scalar uh, cross product. Well, the trouble is if you've got A cross B, you know, C equals A cross B, can you say uh, A equals C divided by B? Uh, no. So, you know, so that was his problem. And it really uh, puzzled him for, for quite a while. And he'd, uh, he trained his children to, uh, every morning he came down for breakfast, to ask him, uh, Papa, can you multiply triplets yet? Which were these you know, vectors, we later called vectors. And then uh, on this fateful day, uh, he, uh, he's, he got it. And he uh, went with his wife on his usual Sunday stroll through... Uh, uh, Dublin, and uh, he committed a criminal act on the bridge. He uh, engraved in graffiti the basic equation you need to solve this problem w without explanation, just the formula. And then later when he described it, he's saying, and here there dawned on me the notion that we must admit in some sense a fourth dimension of space for the purpose of calculating with triples. An electric circuit seemed to close and a spark flashed forth. Remember, it was 1843, so you know, uh, there's a lot of excitement about electric stuff, but long before Tesla and Edison. And um, the key thing was that he decided you can't do it with three. There's no way to do it with three. But you can do it with four. And so uh, then he wrote a book which uh, is basically incomprehensible. It's like 800 pages of he heavy math, but we'll simplify it a lot. So the insight was uh, you can't do it with three components. And then he took his cue from complex numbers where we introduce a, quote, imaginary number. And uh, he said, well, maybe if we have more of them, you know, maybe there are other things when you square them, they become minus one. And so that was his key insight. He used uh, the notation IJK such that I squared and J squared and K squared are minus one. And then very importantly, he added this IJK equals minus one. And this is what he engraved in the bridge. Uh, and it's still there, although heavily worn by mathematicians touching it uh, to see if they can get the inside from. Uh, anyway, uh, fr from those, you can get everything else. For example, if you want to know what IJ is, well, you just multiply IJK by K, and you get K squared, which is minus 1, so it's going to be minus 1 times, you know, and so on. So you get K. Uh, so these others are all subsidiary. He didn't bother engraving them. He just took the... Uh, uh, importantly, multiplication is not commutative. So, you know, IJ is K, JI is minus K. And um, that sort of corresponds to cross products, so this kind of suggests an, uh, a connection with uh, vectors. And so there are lots of different ways of thinking about quaternions. Uh, one is just simply as a real part and three different flavors of imaginary parts rather than just one imaginary part. Uh, but then you can take these three and think of them as a vector in space and uh, treat the whole thing as a scalar, q0, plus this vector, and use this notation, which uh, has a scalar, comma, vector part. Uh, or you can just write it as a four vector, a thing with four components. So uh, I use this notation with a little circle over it to denote a quaternion. It's not standard, so don't get confused by that. 
But uh, when I'm writing stuff, it's very important for me to distinguish the scalar, the vector, and the quaternion. So I use the little circle to denote that. Uh, another way of thinking about quaternions is as four by four matrices. And that brings us back to that isomorphism we had that was useful for um, cross products. There will be an isomorphism uh, of quaternions with four by four matrices um, that allows us to do multiplication. And yet another way uh, is to think of a complex composite of two complex numbers. So, you know, complex numbers are real plus i times a real. Now imagine that you replace the real with complex numbers. You've got something with four components. Of course, you've got to be careful because you've got two different types of imaginary things. That's actually a way we aren't going to use, but it's a way that leads you to uh, other things. For example, you can um, use that idea again. And now you get, instead of four components, eight. And then again, you can get 16 components. So you can build these algebras that have uh, you know, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16 components, and they get weirder and weirder. We're going to stick with 4. That's uh, as far as we need to go. OK, so um, here's the view of multiplication using uh, Hamilton's uh, basic uh, uh, explanation of how to multiply these things. We, here are two quaternions. We're going to multiply them. And obviously, we're going to get 16 terms. And then, uh, you know, I, j times k is minus i. Um, and so we can gather them up as, again, a scalar part. And then these three um, uh, imaginary parts. And that's, you know, that's the bottom baseline truth. But it's kind of uh, too detailed. It's kind of hard to uh, keep remember that. And it's uh, for us who are now, remember this was before vectors. But today, we're all into vectors and scalars. So in that notation, it's a lot easier to write it this way. So here's a quaternion p, a quaternion q. We multiply them together, and we get this quaternion. And the scalar part of it is just uh, the scalar parts multiplied minus the dot product of the vector parts, and so on. And it's non-commutative. Why? Because it includes this cross product at the end here. So if we, if we interchange these two, we're going to get q cross p, which is, of course, minus p cross. OK, so this is actually a way we're going to use it. Um, just It's much more compact th than this. Uh, here's another notation that's sometimes uh, very useful. And this is analogous to the um, isomorphism we had between vectors and uh, skew symmetric 3x3 three three matrices. Here we have an isomorphism between a quaternion and a 4x4 four four, uh, matrix, which happens to be uh, orthogonal. And if the quaternion is a unit quaternion, it's also a unit uh, normal. So this actually, in our case, is typically an orthonormal 4x4 four four matrix. Um, and so th this multiplication up here can be written as this product of a matrix times a, a vector. And there's quite a bit of structure to this. You can see you know, the first column is just the quaternion p. And then you can see that it's sort of skew symmetric except for the diagonal, which would be 0 if it was skew symmetric. Um, and so uh, we can write the product of two quaternions uh, in that form. So we can write P, Q. So this is just like cross product, you know, where we said A cross B is some matrix times B. Similarly here, P, Q can be written as this matrix times Q, and the matrix uh, looks like this. And the matrix is orthogonal, and it's normal if it's a unit quaternion. And um, if we get rid of P0, then it's skew symmetric. And again, just as with cross products, uh, we have the choice of either expanding the first part into a matrix or the second part. So here's the other version, where now we've um, turned Q into a 4x4 four four matrix. And this 4x4 four four matrix looks a lot like this one. The, the first column is pretty much the same. The first row is pretty much the same. What's different is this 3x3 three three submatrix is flipped. It's, it's uh, transpose. Uh, so they're very similar. But, and this corresponds, again, to the fact that multiplication is non-commutative. If those two pieces were the same, then the whole operation would have been commutative. OK, so um, 
now that we've got you know the basics and different ways of representing it, uh, it's easy to prove some of these uh, basic results. So first of all, uh, it's clear that it's not commutative, and and it ha you know that's why we're talking about it. We wouldn't be talking about it if it was commutative because then there's no way that it can represent rotation. Uh, it's associative, and that's not too hard to prove. You just use the formula for multiplication. It's just a bit of messy algebra. Uh, then we define a conjugate. And the conjugate, in analogy with complex numbers, just means you negate the imaginary part. Um, and then the next result you can get is that the conjugate of a product is the product of the conjugates in reverse order, which is just like uh, matrix multiplication. A, B all transpose is B transpose, A transpose. So there, there's some analogies here. And you'll, you know, if you're into physics, you'll realize that you know, different heroes of physics had different uh, ways of approaching quantum physics, and some of them like to do it with a sort of complex number view, and some of them like to do it with a matrix view, and you can find that they're kind of equivalent. Yeah. So uh, I've done a little of that, and I'm going to do more of it. And the main reason is that we can get a closed form solution because we can differentiate with respect to a quaternion. We can't differentiate with respect to orthonormal matrix. So that's kind of the main reason. But there are these subsidiary reasons, like if you can't get a closed form solution, you can do a search in the space of rotations, and you can sample that space efficiently, either uh, uniformly or randomly, once you've got the notion of a space of rotation, which is the case with quaternions. Okay, so there are a few other pro uh, dot product. Well, the dot product, you know, if we think of it as a four vector, it's just the ordinary dot product of a four vector. If we think of it in terms of scalar and vector, well, then it's the product of the scalars plus the dot product of the vectors. But, you know, underneath it's just Q0 squared plus QX squared plus, uh, sorry, uh, P0, Q0 plus PX, QX, etc. And therefore there's a norm. We can define a norm. And this is the, perhaps the most important. If we multiply uh, Q by its conjugate, uh, it turns out we get a real quantity. There's no imaginary part, and it's, it's this. Uh, it's uh, the dot product of Q with itself times E, where, where E is this quaternion that has a scalar. It's a scalar 1, and I could have just written 1 there, but that looks sort of funny, so I invented this symbol, uh, which is a quaternion that has uh, you know, no vector part. And why is this important? Well, if you can do that, then you have division. Um, so the multiplicative inverse is, is this. And that was the problem with the uh, triplets. There was no way of defining an inverse. And here, here we can define an inverse, well, except for Q equals 0. But then that's always a problem. So, And so this means, for example, that... Um, we can uh, get the inverse of a rotation uh, very easily. First of all, in a rotation, we're going to be dealing with unit quaternions, so q dot q is 1. So in the case of that uh, uh, unit quaternion representation, the inverse is just the conjugate. Uh, sort of like in the case of orthonormal matrices, the inverse is just the transpose. Okay, and then there are a few other sort of minor properties, and you can just take those on faith, or you can check them by doing the multiplications. So the dot product of uh, products is the product of dot products. A little surprising that. Uh, and then uh, th this first line is the uh, special case of the second line, which is more useful in calculations. And then th this one's pretty handy, so what's happened here? Well, sometimes we have a, a quaternion on one side. We'd like to move it to the other side of a dot product. Uh, and it turns out we can do that as long as we conjugate it. So we, we've moved the Q from the left side of the dot to the right side of the dot and uh, just conjugated it. And it's easy to prove that. We just multiply by you know, Q conjugate and so on. Okay. So, uh, so we're going to use unit quaternions to represent rotation, and we'll see right now how that's related to the other notations for rotation. But we're dealing with vectors, so what about vectors? Well, uh, we'll need to have a quaternion way of representing vectors, and of course, uh, it's obvious. We just leave out the scalar part. Conversely, if we wanted to represent a scalar, we could just leave out the vector part. 
Okay, so we're going to convert our vectors in 3D to these funny uh, quaternions, purely imaginary quaternions, uh, manipulate them in that space, and then bring them back into, the, into 3D. Um, for this special case only of these types of quaternions, there's lots of interesting properties. First of all, the uh, conjugate, of course, is just negating it because conjugate means negating the imaginary part. Uh, the dot product is just the dot product. So this is the dot product of the quaternions. This is the dot product of the corresponding vectors. And since the scalar part is zero, you know, the, it's obvious that this is the case. So we can easily compute dot products. Uh, if we multiply two of these special quaternions, we get this funny thing. It has the dot product in it and the cross product. And this is why some critics of this notation uh, called it a hermaphrodite monster. You know, it's got both sexes built into it, dot products and cross products. And they, they thought this was a disadvantage. Well, for, you know, for some purposes, it's actually an advantage. Then if we take the product of R and S and take the dot with T, uh, we get the triple product, R, S, T. And the triple product is often pretty useful, aside from computing volumes or something. Um, and again, this is very simple to prove. You know, once you have a zero scalar part, uh, then all you're going to get is the vector part of t dotted with th this thing, r cross s. And of course, that's just you know r cross s dot t. That's the triple product r s t. And so on. So that's how we represent um, vectors. OK, scalars, yeah, we can do that. Finally, we get to rotation. So how do we do rotation? Well, it turns out that a uh, simple product of a quaternion with another quaternion won't do it because it takes us out of 3D into 4D. We need an operation that takes us back into uh, 3D. And so um, this is a little bit like uh, you can do rotation in the plane by doing some operation that takes you out into 3 space but then you have to have another part of the operation that takes you back into the plane now in a rotated form. So this is like that. If we multiply two quaternions, we're basically doing an operation of rotation in four space. And now we need to find an uh, operation that doesn't undo that, but takes us back into three space. And this is uh, exactly what, what happens here. So we take our vector r, turn it into a quaternion with zero scalar part, then we pre-multiply by Q and post-multiply by Q uh, conjugate, and magically we're back in the, in the real world so that this quaternion R prime has a zero scalar part. And so this is how we're going to do rotation. Now, uh, there are many different ways of analyzing this. One is to use that uh, trick we had of representing quaternion multiplication as multiplication of four by four matrices and a four vector. Right, so we take these first two and turn them into that. And then we take the second uh, multiplication, and this time we turn the Q conjugate into a matrix, this matrix over here. Okay, so this operation is actually equivalent to that operation. And what is this? This is a 4x4 four four matrix. It's a product of two 4x4 four four matrices. And if you multiply them out, you get this. And this, uh, the most interesting property of this is that the first row and the first column are mostly zeros. And the result is that if you have a vector in 3D, which has a zero part, scalar part, and multiply it by this, um, there'll be no zero scalar part, right? Because you're multiplying this by zero, and then you're adding all of these zeros multiplied by whatever, and you get zero. So, so uh, all this has proved so far is that this operation will, in fact, get you back into 3D. So, um, and this, uh, by the way, this submatrix is also, and this actually is our 3x3 three three orthonormal rotation matrix. Um, okay, so that's the uh, equation we're going to use for rotation. And this is the scalar part. We can compute the scalar part. And if the scalar part of the original vector is zero, we get zero for the scalar part of the new vector. The vector part can be computed this way. So if you don't want to, 
you know, jump into the ocean of quaternions. You can do everything using scalars and vectors. Here's the formula, right? So, uh, you know, just dot products and cross products, very easy. When we uh, use this operation, we can easily, pr well, with a bit of algebra, we can prove that it preserves dot products, right? You just take this formula, apply it to R, and then apply it to S, take the dot product, and you get R dot S. Um, <clears throat> and so it preserves dot products. Uh, similarly, it preserves triple products. Remember we had this special form that this uh, multiplication gave us a triple product of the vector, uh, the, the underlying vectors. Well, it preserves triple products. So, so that's it. It's a uh, rotation, right? It preserves dot products. It preserves triple products. Um, so that's good. Uh, we don't know yet what rotation, but, but we know it has to be a rotation because it preserves length and angles and it preserves handedness. And then the other thing we were talking about was not just rotating a vector, but composing rotations. We wanted that to be easy. Well, uh, so suppose we first rotate, uh, we take our vector r, we rotate it using q, and then we take the result and we rotate it using p. So we, we write this. And because these operations are associative, I can rewrite it this way. And that tells you, oh, uh, composition of rotation is just multiplication of quaternions. Very easy. And actually computationally efficient as well which is very different from axis and angle notation or Euler angles, where it's very hard to compose rotations. Um, so then we need to figure out what rotation is it? Uh, or if we have specified rotation in some other form, how do we turn it into quaternion? Well, uh, this is the formula we just uh, sort of derived on the previous page. Uh, and here's Rodriguez's formula from a while back. And then if we identify corresponding pairs, first thing you notice is that Q, the vector part, is parallel to omega. So the vector part of the quaternion is in the direction of the axis. Sort of makes sense. Um, and we can actually prove that easily if you, uh, if you, plug, um, um, if you plug Q in here for R, what happens? Well, this part drops out because, you know, uh, Q cross Q is zero. And then uh, this becomes uh, Q dot Q times Q. And this becomes something times Q. So what, uh, the whole thing, both of these are vectors in the Q direction. So R prime is going to be in the Q direction. So uh, very easy to show that uh, Q becomes Q. You know, and that's uh, Euler's axis theorem. So uh, it's very easy to see that the vector part is parallel to the um, axis of rotation. We don't know yet how long it's supposed to be, uh, and we don't know what the angle is. But anyway, uh, leave out some of this. The conclusion is this is our representation, uh, uh, conversion. So if we know axis and angle, we can compute the uh, uh, quaternion. So that's one of the conversions between the, you know, we have eight different ways of representing it, so they're, uh, 8 times 7, 56 different conversions we could possibly do, but we're not going to do them. Uh, so this is one. The other one we saw earlier where we, con we produced the orthonormal matrix. That's another important one because we use orthonormal matrices all the time. We need to be able to go back and forth between axis and angle, which is this formula, and between the orthonormal matrix, and that was that previous formula. Now, uh, there, so there are two things about this. One of them, this is a unit quaternion. You easily prove you, you know, take its dot product with itself and you get cos squared theta over two plus sine squared theta over two. So, so that's one thing. So we're not talking about arbitrary quaternions, just unit quaternions. And then the other thing that's a little bit uh, annoying is that minus Q is the same rotation as plus Q. Why? Well, imagine you plug minus Q into this formula the minuses just multi disappear. So what does this mean? It means that if we think of uh, the sphere as representing the space of rotation, opposite points are actually the same rotation. So it's, you know, uh, it's very nice to think of a sphere in four dimensions as the space of rotation, and then we can produce ways of sampling that space and taking integrals and take computing averages and so on. 
But you have to keep in mind that it, you really only want half the sphere because the opposite side, the reflected side, uh, represents the same rotations. And tipital points are identified. So we use, we're going to use this in uh, photogrammetry and uh, in particular uh, in absolute orientation. We already talked about that, and this is from last lecture. So we got uh, points in space identified, measured in two coordinate systems. We want to know the uh, coordinate transformation between those two systems. Um, and it's dual to the other problem where we have the same coordinate system, but we have uh, two objects, or we have one object moving. And uh, we modeled it this way, where coordinates in the left system are rotated and s translated to produce coordinates in the right uh, coordinate system. And we want the best fit rotation and translation, meaning we want to minimize some error. And what we're given are a bunch of corresponding points measured in the two coordinate system, left, left and right. And then we talked about this mechanical, this physical analog uh, that uh, we, want to we want to make these errors small. And so one way to do it is to have these springs which have energy proportional to the distance squared and the energy, total energy in those springs is the sum of squares of errors, and the system wants to minimize that, so that's the physical model of how it finds the rotation and trans translation. Uh, so then we, uh, we uh, did this. So uh, this is the error term, right? Because if I take the left coordinate and I rotate and translate it, I, I get this, and that should be equal to the right coordinate. Uh, and I subtract them, I get the remaining error, I square that, I add all of those errors. Uh, then, first step, let's find the translation. We did this last time. Uh, one way to do it, which is not the way we did it in class, is just differentiate with respect to the translation, R0. And this is, uh, you know, this notation, this is the norm which is really the dot product of this thing with itself. If we differentiate it, we get uh, twice this. And we set that equal to zero, and then we can split. So we have a sum of three terms. We can split that into uh, three sums. Right? So for example, of course we get rid of the two. That's not very interesting. And we get this, and the th and final result was just that uh, the translation is what takes the um, centroid in the left system uh, after rotation into the centroid of the right system. So, so that's um, kind of intuitive and nice. It says that you know, whatever your transformation is, it should map the centroid of this point cloud into the centroid of that point cloud. And one of the nice features of it is that you don't even need correspondences. You just compute the centroid of those clouds. So for this part, uh, you don't need to know which point in that cloud corresponds to which point in the other cloud. And, of course, right now, we can't get the answer because we don't know R. But this is the formula we're going to come back to at the end to get the translation. And so at that point, we can, uh, at that point, we can uh, move the origin to the centroid and uh, add a dash to the Rs, indicating they're now measured with respect to the centroid. So uh, when we do that, the formula simplifies. Uh, this, now we're minimizing this expression uh, where these uh, R prime and R R prime and R L prime are defined in terms of uh, coordinates with respect to the centroid. We subtract out the centroid, subtract out the centroid there. And okay, then we take this and we multiply this out. Again, the, the uh, norm squared is just the dot product of this thing with itself. So think of it written out that way. Then when you multiply out, you get four terms. You gather them up, and you, you get this. And here we use one little trick, which is that we noted that the length of a vector is not changed by rotation. So over here, we, we really get r times uh, the left vector squared. But we know that after rotation, it's the same length, so we just replace it. OK, and then at that point, uh, these two things are fixed. They're given by the data. They're, they're not going to depend on the rotation you pick. So forget about them. Uh, we need to focus on this middle term. It's the only one we have control over. We can change r. But it has a minus sign. So we're trying to minimize something. 
So that means we want to maximize uh, this term. And that, that's where we got to last time. And uh, you now I was explaining it in terms of uh, C, the sea urchin analogy, where we've got these spines and we're trying to get them to um, be as lined up as close as possible so that their dot product is as large as possible. The dot product of corresponding points. Now we need correspondences. Uh, and um, this is a classic problem in uh, spacecraft attitude control. You have the direction to uh, stars in your cameras, and you're trying to uh, line them up with the catalog directions. And of course, you want to make the, uh, and it, it's a good analogy because in this case, we don't care about the length. We don't have the length. We don't know how, we, from the camera, we have no idea how far away the stars are, and we don't care. And if we move sideways, actually that direction doesn't change because in comparison to the distance to the stars, our own motion is microscopic. So uh, this would be the thing you want to maximize in, in that case. Uh, and, but how do you do it? Well, you know, we, we're sort of tuned to using calculus to solve all these problems, just differentiate with respect to the unknown uh, transformation. But, you know, what does it mean to uh, differentiate with respect to R? Now, I'm sort of making fun of it, but you can actually pursue this further. Uh, what you need to do is not just differentiate with respect to R, but impose all of those constraints that I talked about. And you can do that. It just gets messy. You know, you have to impose that R transpose R is the identity, and you have to impose the determinant of R is plus one. That, that's the hard one. OK, so let's not do it that way. Let's use our newfangled uh, quaternion notation. So here we have a dot product of two vectors. And we can express that here as the dot product of two quaternions with zero scalar part. Right? So we, we map this uh, RLI prime into uh, a quaternion RLI prime. And we map this uh, RRI prime into this quaternion. And it's, all you've done is add the zero scalar part. There's, you know, I've also flipped them around because, you know, dot products commute, so you can do that. Okay, and this is where I use that trick. Remember I said that sometimes you want to move something from one side of a dot product to the other. Uh, here I've taken this uh, quaternion, flipped it to the other side, but I had to conjugate it. Now it's already conjugated, so conjugate of the conjugate is the thing itself. So I get this expression. And then I make use of the uh, property that I can write this quaternion product as a matrix times vector. And I can write this as a matrix times vector. So I, so I get that. And then I make use of the fact that a dot product is just the left thing transposed multiplied by the right thing. And then finally, I can pull out the Q. So, so this is important. I can uh, you know, separate out the Q on both sides, so it doesn't it doesn't vary with I, and so I end up with this uh, product. Um, w so this is where all my data is. All my measurements are buried in here. This is a four by four matrix that I get from my measurements, and now all I want to do is make this thing as large as possible. Well, you know, uh, not quite. Uh, because I can make this as large as I like by making Q large. Right? So I have to be careful to impose that constraint. And, and so that's, uh, so quaternions are not a redundant representation because they have four, degree, four numbers. And you have to impose this extra constraint. OK, and then there are different ways of doing this. So first of all, uh, let's see, uh, what is N? Well, N is, again, got from the data. Uh, and there are two ways to do this. If you know about Lagrange multipliers, you can uh, add another term that imposes the constraint. So the constraint is that q dot q equals 1, or min 1 minus q dot q equals 0. So you can impose that way. And we'll do it another way that doesn't involve needing to know about Lagrange multipliers. Anyway, in either method, we can now differentiate with respect to q which is you know, uh, amazing. Uh, we can differentiate with respect to rotation. Of course, in the case of translation, you know, no one's surprised you can differentiate with respect to translation or position. But for rotation, that's quite something. If we do, 
we get this. And this is just using the ordinary rules for uh, differentiation of a dot product and differentiation of a matrix times a vector, which, by the way, are in the appendix of the book, which, by the way, is on Stellar. So if you need to refresh your memory about differentiating with respect to a vector, it's all there. So. Um, and so what does this say? Well, this says that nq equals lambda q. Well, that should remind you of stuff we've done before, right? It's, it's an eigenvector. So q has to be an eigenvector, and lambda is the eigenvalue. And since we want to make this as large as possible, we pick the eigenvector that corresponds to the largest eigenvector, which is sort of unusual. In the past, we've always wanted to minimize something and wanted the smallest uh, eigenvalue. He, here, because of that sign flip, we want the largest one. Um, and uh, what is it the eigenvector of? It's a 4 by 4 real symmetric matrix, which is constructed from the data. And um, uh, so a couple of notes on that. So one of them is, you know, we said for a 2 by for a 2 by 2 matrix, we actually explicitly gave the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, because we know how to solve quadratics. And I mentioned last time that for 3 by 3, uh, it can be done because the characteristic equation is a cubic polynomial in lambda. And, and someone knows how to solve cubics in closed form. Um, by the way, this used to be a, a big game, particularly amongst Italian mathematicians. You know, they would, uh, this was, these problems were a real puzzle to them. And they were very proud when they solved them, you know, correctly so. But there, was, uh, there wasn't the same sort of modern you know, publication and tenure and whatever. It's like uh, you've solved this tough problem and you know, you're very proud of it. What do you do with it? You don't want to just give it away. And yet you want to be able to say later, you know, I got that 10 years ago. So they'd come up with all these weird ways of coding and coding their solution, and they, uh, like in a story or as a sort of uh, parable or some sort of other mathematics. And then later on, you know, Ferrari, who was one of the guys who did this, could say that, oh, I solved this years before Cardano, who is another guy, because look at that poem I wrote. It tells you how to do this. So, so anyway, um, they discovered how to solve cubics. Here we're going to have a quartic, right, because it's four by four. It's going to be fourth order. And guess what? They have closed form solutions, and those Italian mathematicians and others figured out how to, how to do, do it. Basically, how do you do any of these things? Well, the usual trick, you try and find a way of reducing third order to second order, because you know how to do second order. And quartics, uh, first step is reduce it to a cubic. Solve the cubic, and then the rest is easy. And so, uh, can you solve uh, fifth order? No. Okay, so it's, it's good that some of you know that that's it. You can't... Now, of course, today with computers, we can always numerically solve any of these. But um, if you want to s have a, quote, closed form solution, you know, then you do need to know that you can solve one, two, three, four, but that's it. Then higher order, you can't uh, solve in closed form using addition, subtraction, multiplication, and square roots. Okay, uh, so... And this matrix down here look, is more familiar to you than n. That's because this is simply the dyadic product of the vector in the left coordinate system and the vector in the right coordinate system. So this is a 3 by 3. Each of these is a 3 by 3 matrix. That's a dyadic product. And you just keep on going, stepping through your point pairs and adding them up, and you get a 3 by 3 matrix, which is not symmetric. Um, and so it has nine independent quantities. And uh, let's think about n. Well, uh, n um, is 4 by 4, so it has 16. So, so how does that work? Um, it turns out that uh, n is rather special. It, it turns out n is symmetric. And, and uh, it turns out that it's not that easy to prove. And I, um, the one mistake in this paper was that, um, I think I said something like it's obvious that it's symmetric, but it takes some, anyway, it's symmetric. So that means four by four symmetric, we've got uh, four on the diagonal, and then we have um, six more, no, 10. We have 10 independent, so it's not 16, but it's 10. But it's still, it's still too many, right? Because we only have nine in M. 
Well, it turns out that this matrix is very special because um, the uh, determinant, the, the characteristic equation up here has, some, has this important property, that um, that cubic term is zero, which actually makes it easier to reduce it to a cubic. Uh, and um, so N is a symmetric 4 by 4 matrix with a, a trace of zero. So that means we've got 10 minus 1 is 9. So, that, so now it matches. M has nine independent values. Okay, we, we don't need to really know. And if you're actually going to implement this, you might want to know this. But just to know that you can compute all the coefficients of the characteristic equation, and then you go off and solve your quarter. So uh, the main application is going to be absolute orientation. Uh, but it also has lots of other applications that we you know, already talked about. And in, in, if you go over to Draper Lab, where they do all this uh, spacecraft control, you'll find people who uh, know about quaternions because that's what's used there. So. Um, desirable properties. So we had this uh, table. Let's see how we're doing. Uh, ability to rotate vectors. Yes, we Q, R, Q, conjugate. Ability to compose rotations. Yes, P times Q is the composition. Intuitive non-redundant representation. Well, it's almost non-redundant. It has four numbers to represent three degrees of freedom. Um, and, but the redundancy is very simple. It's just the unit, vec unit quaternion. Uh, is it intuitive? Eh, you know, one part, uh, the, the vector part is in the direction of the axis. That's sort of intuitive. Computational efficiency, we haven't talked about that yet. You know, how does it compare with matrix operations? Uh, can we do things like interpolate orientations? Yes. You know, suppose that you have um, your artist has the ballerina doing a turn and got, it, got her in this position and then in that position uh, rotate it, how do you do all the in-betweening? Uh, do you take the initial rotation matrix and the final rotation matrix, take some sort of weighted average? Well, that's not going to be orthonormal. So here it's trivial, right? You just uh, take that angle. Suppose that the rotation is about an axis through an angle of 90 degrees. You just split it up into however many frames you need and compute the quaternion uh, correspondingly. Uh, we can take averages of a range of rotations. If you want to know uh, the average loading on the seat belt as your car is tumbling in all possible orientations, you can easily do that. And we can uh, take the derivative as we saw, so we can do optimizations, least squares, uh, if, if there's no closed form solution, we at least have a way of sampling that space of possibilities in a uniform or, or random way. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. How late is it? Well, let's do a couple more things. Okay, so this is where we're going to go after absolute orientation. This is relative orientation, and this is kind of uh, more... So absolute orientation is very important for photogrammetry, you know, making topographic maps from uh, aerial photographs. But in terms of understanding human vision, you know, one of a dozen depth cues is binocular stereo. And so relative orientation there is more important. And so that's the problem of we've got two eyes, and the eyes don't get depth. Uh, they only get directions. So we have the directions in each of those coordinate systems to points out in the world. And I've shown five, and it turns out five is the minimum number you need to solve this problem. And your problem is to find out what that baseline is and what the uh, relative orientation of this coordinate system is relative to that. In other words, we have a translation and we're going to have a rotation. So, so in that respect, it's the same problem. It's just that our data now is not as good. Before, in absolute orientation, we actually know 3D coordinates of all of these points. And that uh, makes it possible to get a closed form solution. Uh, here, we only know the direction. So that's the problem we're going to solve after absolute orientation. Um, then, you know, if you're trying to describe the kinematics of a robot uh, manipulator, well, well, these days people are lazy. You just buy it, and the software does all that for you. But, you know, in, in the old days, uh, you know, we had to walk in the snow. There was no bus. Well, in the old days, you actually had to understand the geometry of these devices. And that means that uh, as you go through each link, you are uh, doing a translation and a rotation. And so um, 
if you want to avoid problems with coordinate systems lining up, particularly in the wrist, uh, then quaternions are a good way to represent the rotation. So in the wrist, for example, you can imagine that if this part now comes up, there'll be a time where this axis in here is parallel to that axis and you've lost a degree of freedom. So. Uh, computational issues. Now, I guess these days computers are pretty fast, so we don't worry about this as much. But if you have to do this for every point in some object in your graphics representation, this, this could be an issue. So let's see how expensive it is. So again, there are two things we want to do, compose rotations and rotate vectors. So for composition, we know it's just multiplying two quaternions. And if you do it the naive way, just following that formula, you get 16 multiplies and 12 adds. Um, and if you do the, do the orthonormal matrix, of course, it's a 3 by 3 matrix product, which is 27 multiplies and 18 adds. So we, we win definitely win here. Let's go to rotating a vector. So we use this formula and we can expand out the part we want, which is the vector part. Uh, 22 multiplies, 16 adds. Compare the matrix product. Oops, 9 multiplies and 6 adds. So here we lose. But uh, this can be rewritten in this form, which has the advantage that you compute the QR once and you use it in two different places and you get it down to 15 multiplies and 12 adds. Uh, and uh, this is naive stuff. You know, pe people that get serious about this go further. For example, with a 3 by 3 matrix, uh, they don't represent it as 3 by 3 matrix. At, at most, you take the first two rows because the other one's implicit. It's a cross product. And so, so um, you know, you could have a competition where you just keep on going uh, on both sides and they end up uh, being similar, uh, uh, but with the advantage for composition going to quaternions and the advantage for uh, rotating vectors going to um, orthonormal. Okay, how about uh, renormalizing? So one of the things that happens, suppose you have a graphic uh, program that's trying to uh, do some motion sequence and you're composing uh, small incremental rotations. And if you represent them, let's say, as orthonormal matrices, you can imagine that because of the limitations of uh, floating point arithmetic, that errors will accumulate. And after a while, your 3 by 3 matrix is no longer orthonormal. And so you'd want to sort of square it up. And that can be done, but it requires doing this. You take your matrix M, you multiply, you take its transpose, multiply by M, and you take the inverse of the square root of the matrix. So, you know, right there. You, you, I'd imagine that you may not know how to do that, but it can be done. But that just suggests that this is not an operation that you'd normally want to do. It's, it's expensive. With uh, quaternions, sure enough, you take the unit quaternion, you multiply it by another unit quaternion, and so on. And because of the limitations of floating point arithmetic, after a while it isn't a unit quaternion, how do you square it up? Well, you know, trivial. So, so this is um, one other s small difference between them. Uh, so, um, uh, just about at the end. So we talked about the space of rotation being uh, the uh, three, three sphere, unit sphere in 4D with antipodal points identified. And it also happens to be identical to the projective space P3, although we don't use that and it's uh, not as handy. Um, then, Sampling regular and random. So how do we sample this space? Well, you know, in 3D, we can easily come up with a regular sampling uh, of space or even a random sampling, but it's not so obvious how to do it here. And one way is to uh, find regular patterns. You know, if, if we're, say we want to sample a sphere regularly, that's not so easy either. Certainly latitude and longitude is not going to do it. But one thing we can do is project uh, polyhedra onto it, because polyhedra are completely regular. So if we project, say, a um, icosahedron or a dodeca icosahedron, which is a soccer ball, anyone here know about soccer? Uh, then we end up with a pattern on the sphere that is regular. 
But there are only some special ones, like uh, regular solids. There are only a few of them. Well, similarly here, except now we're in 4D, and the corresponding things are rotations rather than polyhedra. And so it turns out that if you look at the rotations of polyhedra, they will give you a nice even sampling of that space. Uh, and the rotation groups, are the, so the tetrahedron has 12 rotations that will align it with itself. Uh, the cube and the octahedron have 24. And the icosahedron and dodecahedron have 60. So these give you a perfectly uniform spaced uh, sampling of that space. Unfortunately, that's not a very fine sampling, right? Because 60 in the four-dimensional space. So they're tricks to give you um, a finer sampling. But they all start with those simple ones. And just uh, while I have the slides here, um, if you pick the um, coordinate systems right, you get very simple expressions for these rotation groups. So each of these is a rotation. This one, of course, is the identity rotation, does nothing. Uh, this is the rotation about the x-axis by uh, 180 degrees. And this is about the y-axis and so on. So this is the group for the tetrahedron. They provide a regular space sampling of that space. This is for the hexahedron and the octahedron. And then the, uh, the prize is this one. This is the rotation group for the dodecahedron and the icosahedron. Uh, where the, you know, uh, these A, B, C, Ds are given by these expressions up there. Um, these should look familiar. Um, uh, this only works if you line it up nicely with the coordinate system. Anyway, uh, you, this would be a sampling. So you could try these 60 orientations for uh, your search or your averaging, uh, and then you can interpolate uh, further. Okay, well, we've run out of time, so... That's it for today.